I think we need to pause here and just quickly like do elevate the pitch. What what is um, Staplify and what what exactly do you offer? Yeah, so it's it's become um, a lot broader recently, um, especially when we've been acquiring other businesses. But you know, really, if we say, you know, ultimately what our mission is is to provide tools, technological tools, to schools so that they can integrate technology into different aspects of what they're doing at the school. And those are the obvious things around teaching and learning, but it's also around IT administration, around procurement, um, big data, security. Uh, there's a number of different um, challenges that they, they face. And each of those different um, aspects of, I suppose, running a school can benefit from technology. But where we started, and I think perhaps what we're most known for is really around digital content. So one of the things that um, a school will do first when they're making a transition is to go and say, how do we replace our textbooks? Yeah. So you know, we're providing um, digital textbooks as a start, but then also a lot more digital content so that you know, audio, video, uh, enhanced um, curriculum aligned HTML, Today's episode is brought to you by Schoolscape, the platform that brings schools and suppliers of schools together. Whether you are looking to source IT systems for your school, or you want to upgrade the infrastructure, or even purchase academic materials, Schoolscape is the place to be. On the Schoolscape website, you would be able to find suppliers and source quotes. Next time you'd like to buy anything for your school, pop on over to schoolscape.co.za and find a supplier that suits your needs. That's schoolscape.co.za. Hi, my name is Francois Nordea, and I am a super teacher. And this is Super Teachers Unite, the show that's all about motivating, inspiring, and supporting teachers. And with me today, I'm very excited to have Wesley Lynch, who's the CEO of Snaplify. Um, we're at the Schoolscape Premier event down in Cape Town, and we've got an opportunity to sit down and record this for the show. Wesley, thank you very much for spending time with us. Awesome, awesome. Definitely the most enthusiastic intro ever. It's awesome. <laughs> we're trying to keep it enthusiastic. There's a lot of negativity in education, and a lot of people are down. We have to bring the energy to the, to the education space. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I'm so glad that we've got the opportunity to chat to one of the most uh, prolific uh, education suppliers in the country um, and we'll get into a bit more about Snaplify but as everybody who's familiar to the show knows for the first five to ten minutes of the show we will um, provide value and we'll ask Wesley to provide value to teachers and to principals um, and then the discussion flows from there but afterwards we're going to get to know Wesley and exactly how you ended up becoming the CEO and wow, what's your what's your interest in education and then lastly as you know we've got the quick fire questions just some fun. But before we do that, let's educate. So I think probably um, keeping in line with us being here at Schoolscape, you know, we're looking at uh, what is the technology that schools should be adopting, what are their needs. I think probably the biggest that, uh, point of advice that I would give uh, to teachers, and I think it applies to, to principals and perhaps the education sector as a whole, is first understand really what your problem is, what are you trying to solve. I think uh, it's a very noisy sector. There's, you know, I, I'm very sympathetic towards teachers. They're being told that they need to use all these new uh, different things. Um, and specifically uh, in the technology space. Yeah, I think, I think huge challenges in the, in the technology space. Um, sometimes we need to take a, a step back and understand why. Um, you know, where is the value coming? And uh, particularly, you know, tech companies need to do that of themselves um, um, also. Um, you know, we were chatting earlier about, um, it's quite interesting that teachers, for instance, at this event, um, here to learn from technology providers but we need to look at how we flip the roles a little bit and how do we as technology providers begin to understand you know what are the problems and needs um, of teachers and um, in many cases it's really difficult even for them to distill what their problems are so I think the advice is really to be um, I think introspective understand what are the challenges you have in the day-to-days in your classroom um, how would you like to you know, either address issues how would you like to innovate? And then, you know, armed with that, go out and look for technology that, that helps you address those, those problems. 
the technology for, for technology's sake is not going to serve uh, anyone at all. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think you, you mentioned a very valuable point here in the fact that the, the, the communication between uh, suppliers and teachers are, are, as you said, a bit upside down. Um, the, the technology sector has got products and teachers are looking for products that would fit their need. But as you rightfully said, maybe we should have teachers mention the specific problems that they face and have the technology sector and suppliers come and speak to them and say, well, listen, let's see how we can solve your challenges. Absolutely. I think the guys that are doing well are the guys that are listening to the market. And I think there is that balance also. Um, you need to innovate and that's why it's important. It's not about necessarily, um, you know, if you want to innovate, you've got to come up with new solutions, but you've got to understand really what uh, what the problems, problems are. And it is, you know, that open dialogue between you know, ultimately the, the industry um, and you know we've kind of created this new uh, I suppose vertical ed tech you know and it is marrying of these two worlds I mean my background is certainly mm -hmm. from technology and we're moving in, in, into education in the same way as we're asking perhaps teachers from the education space to meet to move into technology and we need to meet each other you know in, in, in the middle um, and I think it's it's both teachers and schools that understand how to navigate that, that are going to be successful in, in how they integrate technology. And the same is true for you know, technology providers. I think if there's um, a sincerity um, to understand and empathize with the market, I think those are the guys that will also be successful. So I, I find this happen a lot in schools, that teachers are on the ground, in the classroom, um, and they've got the challenges. But then, as you say, there's industry, there's edtech, there's the edtech companies, but they feel so far removed. It, feel, it feels like the, the edtech companies are these giants. Yeah. How can a mere teacher, and I don't like using that word at all because teachers are not just mere teachers, but how can, how can a teacher actually reach out and speak to an edtech company? There's this big, big disjuncture yeah. between that. They, on the, on the ground level, they, they work with the technology. But then it feels like the edtech companies are these giants and um, they're out of our reach and we cannot, cannot reach or, 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 or get to the edtech companies. And then typically when an edtech company comes to pitch to a school, they never see the teacher. They sit in the boardroom with the principal or the bursar and they sell to them. Um, do, you, do you know of any ways or practical tips in which teachers can actually yeah. have their voice heard? I, I think there, there is this, this barrier and uh, I think it definitely is getting better. I mean, the events like this, I think the work you're doing contributes to it. Um, the accessibility I think teachers have to the industry on things like social media is, is, is very, very direct. And I think the, the companies that are sincere about engaging and listening, you know, for instance, if we're mentioned on social media, we have to address those things. You know, if someone's got questions, we, you know, failure to do those things, I think is, is you know, you're setting yourself for, up for disasters really so um, most of the companies I think uh, will engage I think it's for teachers to understand that I think they do have a voice um, they the challenge is really on them to integrate technology and to manage how we transition into this, this new era and I think it's made uh, it's put a lot of pressure on them uh, it, it, it is something that you know instills a sense of anxiety and I think if we can bridge that and instill more confidence, then I think teachers will, will go out and uh, will ask these questions. And it's much the same as you'll see in a, a classroom. You know, if you're the pupil sitting at the back and you're nervous to ask, ask the question, well, you know, you, you're going you're gonna to struggle along. And it's just, you know, how do we make this environment where there's no such thing as a silly tech question, you know, raise these things and, and collaborate together. So I think those are some of the cultural things that, um, you know, we all need to, need to work on. And it definitely is, it is getting better. And then I think when we talk about you know selling to schools, um, it's it's just the nature of I think you know the person who pays and the person that uses are two different people. And yeah. I think that's really challenging um, for schools that want to procure. Well, I think maybe it's worthwhile for them you know to set up something like a procurement committee with different stakeholders, including teachers, that you know when you go and speak to them that they are represented, and that requires some institutional change. I think in the school structures, which we do see is happening in, in you know, more progressive schools. And then it's also a strategy that you know, we employ is to understand that the people that might make the decisions um, are the principals or bursars or whatever, but the guys that are going to motivate are going to be the teachers, that we need to establish direct relationships with the teachers. So a lot of the activities that we perform and the value that we take to market is to add value to teachers 
directly. So we've got a lot of initiatives where we're providing you know, what is high value paid for content, for instance, to free for teachers, because we know that we need to foster relationships with them because they will be our evangelists in the market. If we look after them and it works for them, then you know they will help promote us in those schools when we have the conversations or you know at the very least when we're sitting with a principal and they go and say hey you know teachers have you heard of these snapify guys what we really want to say is yo you know i actually use them in my class already so teachers i think have a lot more um power actually because they are the guys in the trenches but i think it's kind of like an informal power at um, at the moment and I think it's, it's, it's similar, and I like the fact that you mentioned using social media because that breaks away the barrier. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to work through the principal to get to an edtech company. Yeah. Um, and I've seen uh, Snapify on all the um, uh, social media platforms. Um, you guys are there and very accessible. Yeah. So I think that's definitely something that, that teachers can do. Is like If you've got a query, if you want to know something, go onto social media engage with suppliers the ones that are not responding to you on social media are obviously not yeah. really in touch yeah. uh, with ed tech if uh, if we can say yeah. it like and that and if it's sensitive things um, maybe a little bit shy um it's help at snapify.com guys can send us uh, an email in and um you know we can take it from there and it could be you know really about the platform obviously we're sending a lot of textbooks it can even be recommendations on you know books we get asked um questions that are you know, even just related to operating system issues I mean, not directly related to us but it's the kind of thing that you know we're in the value chain we're and particularly with parents they're, they're stuck um, someone's got to help them so you know um, we're happy to take on some of those challenges you, you just mentioned something very pertinent is the fact that it's not just the teacher and the learner in the classroom it's also the parents because the parents feel massive they, they, they feel very um, I also want to say um, isolated in this um, and if they don't if they're not familiar with the tech they're really worried about their child's education yeah, I, I mean isolated is the perfect word that's exactly what I would have used um, often the decision you know to introduce the technologies made by the school and then it's really imposed on the teachers sometimes you know, and there definitely could be things that are done done better there but it's absolutely imposed upon the the, the parents and m many parents obviously you know they're happy to see the technology has been introduced it's really seen as you know obviously the way of the future and, um, but we need to be mindful also of the change management and the journey that that they go on so um, you know, we see the bulk of our support is from about 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And those are all, it's, it's all parents, you know, and particularly if you look at, you know, who we're going to give support to when we work with primary schools, it's almost certainly the parents more so than, mm -hmm. than the learner. And uh, they need to be taken on the journey just as, as much. Um, and it, often it requires training. People are um, very uh, quick to assume that the the parent is, is going to know how you know very basic things work and even you know there might be the first device in the house is a tablet they don't even really know how to set it up um, th things like that um, you know they, they need to be seen as a stakeholder in the value chain um, very very seriously no I agree with you and I think there's this, there's a responsibility on teachers to start having a bit more empathy because I know we are under pressure and we are expected to include these 21st century skills in our classroom and so forth, but we just expect the parents to come on board. Like this is in the best interest of your kids, so you must know how to use it. And we don't really have empathy for, for those parents that really struggle. And we just assume people know because everybody's on Facebook, everybody is operating a system at work and we just expect everybody to know when that is not the case. I think it's all, it's all about this collective journey. You know? Um, it mustn't be this feeling we're going on a journey and you're dragging someone with it needs to be set from the very beginning and I think that's where it comes to school leadership it's about saying we're going on this journey this is why we believe it is important let's all go on this journey together and creating even frameworks you know parents to help parents also you know that those things um, are, are really important because um, it's you know it to put the, the onus purely on you know the the principal or a, or a teacher like you said the in the short term introducing the technology will bring more complexity to begin with and you know there's a learning curve and you get over it then you start realizing returns but in the beginning it can be very very uh, stressful and anxiety uh, inducing and those need to be proactively managed and almost like expected even just saying it's going to be stressful in the beginning 
but it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, even just that goes a really long way. Yeah, and I like that in just providing the support and, and knowing that, you know what, not everybody knows everything and we're on this journey together and let's, let's assist each other. If, we, if we're going to try and fake it till we make it, people are going to see right through it. Absolutely. But just be authentic. Listen, this is a new system we're using. Or this is new tech we're using. Everybody is going to learn from this. Be patient, but we're on this journey together. At the end of the day, it has the best interest of your child yeah. at heart. I, mean, I think um, talking to that also is it's important you know, with technology, you have the ability to measure things far more than perhaps you know, some of the traditional methods that have been in education. It's also important to measure and then look at the data, you know, utilization, um, how a teacher is using it, what are the times, is it being used at home, what are the barriers, to understand, do you believe that um, the, the course that you've decided, you know, whether it's an intervention strategy or whatever, is it having the desired results? Because sometimes you, you think things are going one way, but they're really not. And it's important for um, institutions to, to course correct. So one of the things we see a lot is the introduction of technology and, you know, along with that, there's an expected usage trend. You will see, for instance, if, you know, schools are using more of a flipped classroom. And in many cases, institutions believe that they are conducting a particular teaching style, but the data shows that's not the case. Yeah. You know, they believe that um, learners are accessing materials and that um, whilst they go home for hope, homework or whatever, but you actually might see a decline in, in, in utilization. Um, are teachers using the technology to the same degree as, as learners? Uh, which teachers maybe are apprehensive and need training? You, you have all this data and it's important to look at at least, I would say, each term and be very introspective and decide how do you course correct. Mm. It's it's not good enough to put a strategy in place at the beginning of the year, keep your head down, you know, and uh, hold your thumbs, hope that it's going to, to work like you um, hoped, I suppose, um, and only course correct at the end of the year. It's, 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 it's just too long. Exactly. No, it, it, it's such rapid change. And but this is the, this is the advantage of having edtech. Um, and you you have access to the analytics of the data and you can see if is this useful is it not useful and then correcting in that way I want to touch on a point that you made um, during your presentation here at Schoolscape um, in that's that's this um, the, the matter of connectivity because when people think about edtech they always think I have to be connected to the internet and in our country unfortunately uh, not all area geographical areas are served equally um, when it comes to connectivity uh, but you mentioned that um, as well as being online, it's also important to have offline capabilities when you have an edtech product. Absolutely. I mean, having internet makes everything better. You know, so I think the first prize is, you know, there's a massive difference in experience between no connectivity and limited connectivity. So, and in most cases, um, you can get limited connectivity. So, like some connection and it's slow. And I think. There's things that you know we provide with technology and, and you know the industry as a whole where we're beginning, particularly in the education sector, to optimize the use of limited bandwidth because you know there's just not enough to go around. Um, but the realities are there still are environments where things, um, you know, even if someone may have airtime and then they run out of airtime or load shedding, there's you know connectivity issues or simply they just do not have internet connectivity at home. So there's some very practical things. You cannot, if uh, you know your content is all digital, and you know you're studying, and you know you're one of those guys that left it, you're cramming the last minute uh, before the exam, and all of a sudden you don't have connectivity and you can't study. I mean that's that's a disaster. Yeah. Um, also, don't cram. I'm the self-confessed uh, crammer, but um, I, I, you know the, the reality is, if you want to. Um, deliver a technological intervention in these markets and we want it to be broadly accessible, uh, universally accessible, we have to have an offline mode. You need to be able to operate at least with you know, the, the, the essentials offline and online is an enhanced mm -hmm. e experience. Um, you know, if we're expecting you know, what would be, I suppose, um, very robust internet connections perhaps in, in, in some other developed countries um, and that's one of the challenges we see with you know, imported edtech solutions is this expectation of, of, of universal connectivity 
which unfortunately isn't a reality. And it's important that we build for offline. Otherwise, we really are, you know, if we believe that the technology will bring innovation and improve education, and it's only really accessible to the connected, then we're actually broadening the divide. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I mean, offline for us is, is a deal breaker. You, know, you, you have to be able to operate offline. Okay. Well, I think, thank you very much. There's a lot of value already in this and there's a lot more than 10 minutes, I can promise you. But thank you very much for providing that. No but I want to get to know Wesley Lynch. Like, where, where do you come from and how did you end up being the CEO of such a great company? Um, I suppose, you know, ending up is the, the, the right phrase to use. I mean, um, honestly, didn't start out with this idea that, you know, we wanted to even go into the education space. Um, very much so, and I think it's why we have we have it in our nature to uh, listen to the education sector because we don't see ourselves potentially as um, you know being born from from education. Um, our DNA is definitely in in heavy tech, and I think our motivation is we want to build solutions that solve real world problems mm -hmm. and uh, seeing something that you've built actually get used. That's the, the buzz, I think, of anyone that you know, is really going to go and build, um, build software. And um, yeah, so we started building technology broadly in the content space and, and serviced you know, content um, outside of the education sector. But where we saw um, the real value and where people uh, adopted the technology and I think where there was like a, a, a positive fit and it really resonated with the market was in the education sector and predominantly in um, the school market and um, so you know we really decided to focus um, on that so you know at the time we were even doing magazines and newspapers or whatever and um, but we felt you know again being introspective this is where we would we would add value and we really embraced the education space mm -hmm. and obviously going into it as a new market for us it was also interesting you know um, we came at it I think with a completely different perspective you know, we we didn't uh, approach it in traditional ways we used I think you know expectations that come from perhaps the software world which is you know, why we launched the mm -hmm. freemium uh, version which there are many freemium edtech offerings in, in, mm -hmm. in South Africa. I think we need to pause here and just quickly like do elevate the pitch. What what is um, Staplify and what what exactly do you offer? Yeah, so it's it's become um, a lot broader recently, um, especially we've been acquiring other businesses. But you know, really, if we say, you know, ultimately what our mission is is to provide tools, technological tools, to schools so that they can integrate technology into different aspects of what they're doing at the school. And those are the obvious things around teaching and learning. But it's also around IT administration, mm -hmm. around procurement, um, big data, security. Uh, there's a number of different um, challenges that they, they face. And each of those different um, aspects of, I suppose, running a school can benefit from technology. But where we started, and I think perhaps what we're most known for, is really around digital content. So one of the things that um, a school will do first when they're making a transition is to go and say, how do we replace our textbooks? Yeah. So, you know, we're providing um, digital textbooks as a start, but then also a lot more digital content so that, you know, audio, video, uh, enhanced um, curriculum aligned HTML content. Because that's one of the big criticisms when it comes to um, digital content is like, you don't just want the textbook behind glass. Yeah. You take the textbook away, but now you just put PDFs on in, on a tablet. I mean, you're not really enhancing education. In that way. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's very broad to say enhancing education. And that's a, that's a bold thing. But I mean, you're certainly not enhancing the textbook experience that much. Yeah. But I think the, the, there are a lot of other things that you get out of it. So, you know, the, the obvious thing is data. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the difference between knowing how much different uh, content is being used when understanding the behavior of the learners that you get, even if you are using, you know, pretty much the same book, you know, I think is fundamentally different. It can guide you to understand. I mean, you know, we've had examples where schools have purchased different books because they've realized that the books that they've been buying weren't really being used. They kind of, you know, and we've said, you know, why do you buy this book? Because, well, we've just always have bought that exactly. book. You know? the same old, same um, old. We've always been doing it this yeah. way. We'll always yeah. keep on doing yeah. it this way. Um, and 
the data challenges their thinking. You know? um, so I think it's it's really it's really important. Um, obviously, we want engaging content. We want content that we believe is going to inform the learners, um, inspire them uh, to learn. But I think even if we are moving towards digital execution, like you said, um, you know, we would like to see things move forward in, in, in that regard. But for the publishers that are supplying you know, the digital equivalents of their, their print, I think there really is a utility value in, in, in that also. That, that shouldn't be underestimated. So back to the company then, um, when, did you, when did you start the company? When, when did all of this happen? So it's, it's quite a while now. I think we're in year seven now. So okay. you know, it's not a, a very new thing. I think uh, we started out, uh, maybe we were a little bit ahead of the game. And um, you know, we launched very uh, aggressively, always had a sort of international um, aspirations. And um, you know, at, at least looking at a, a, a pan-African view of, of, of education, you know, looking to markets where we believe we understand them a little bit better and, and, and you know, the localization aspects are a competitive advantage. And um, yeah, launched and like I said, you know, we were quite surprised by um, the, you know, the, the fit with the education sector. You know, in many ways, some guys are, you know, they build a business, the whole thing is they find a problem and then they build a solution. We yeah. built a solution, put it out in the market and went to go see, okay, what problem are we actually are we solving and, and uh, connected with um, you know, the education providers and, and publishers. We work with all the major publishers, helping them um, access the, the, the African market and um, sowed a lot of seeds, I think, um, you know, first went out to East Africa and expanded about three years ago. Uh, then uh, last year, which was a big turning point for us, was launching the freemium version. Yeah. Which is, was always our intention. We really wanted to do that, but to be able to have a self-service version that um, schools can easily sign up for themselves, where we might be the first software platform they, they engage with, was, was really challenging. So, you know, um, some early successes, but we've really seen things um, kick off over the last two years, where I think the industry has, has come into its own. Um, we already have. Um, you know, significant growth in, in Kenya and Nigeria um, that collectively even you know, bigger than our, our, our South African footprint at the moment because I think yeah, it, it's, it's coming of age the industry and schools are looking for looking for solutions yeah no excellent and I think it's such an inspirational story because there are, are many edtech companies um, who are starting off at the moment and wondering how do I approach the market how do I, how do I get in if, if you maybe can elaborate on those first few days of the first few years that you guys started how did you get your first clients so you know like I said uh, you know we were I suppose agile um, we listened mm -hmm. we weren't going to the market and um, dictating. I think we've got very strong um, tech background. So, you know, we built minimum viable product, took it to market. There were a couple of different verticals that were interested, but, you know, the education market were the ones that had really resonated, sat with them, began to understand what is, you know, what is the things that they wanted. And I can tell you this, there's nothing that we have built in the platform that was like speculative. Yeah, you know, it's like and, exactly what that institution yeah, yeah, needed. Yeah, yeah. So when you, when you say you went to the market, like did you go to individual schools? Did you go to government? Like who did? Who did? Across the board. I mean, um, we in education, I think you know you definitely need both the top down and the bottom up approach. Um, if you're going to work in education, the biggest pro provider is going to be government. Yeah. So I think you should have a government strategy in your thinking, and um, at the same time. To do a government deal and work with the government is also challenging. Yeah. So you need to be able to um, operate at, at all those different um, levels, and they're not actually fundamentally that different. If what you're doing is understanding that they're all actually got the same problems, how do you distill that understanding? You may have to, you know, even spend time in classrooms. One of the things we did was. Um, we started hiring teachers onto our team um, because we, we needed you know guys with real world experience that they can go and say you know I 
I really liked using this feature in the classroom. You know, we we can't say those things. No. We were never in a classroom like that. And I think that's um, part of your major success. It's the fact that you took in practicing teachers onto your staff because they've got the real world experience. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, we need we need the sincerity. Um, you can't uh, fake, you know, we, if we want to create edtech, we need to marry education and technology, and that's our Absolutely. core DNA. Um, you know, you you can't fake that. You need to you need to bring that in, and I think in a very deliberate sense. Um, you know, the right people from the right sectors that um, will collaborate, and then you know, hopefully you're on to a, a winning formula. Wesley, thank you very much for this. We're going to move on over to the last segment of the show, which you can't prepare for because I haven't yeah, given have give it well for this old show. We, you can't prepare for it. But specifically, we're going to end off with a few questions. Um, first thing that comes to mind, just share the story with us. We try and keep it as short as possible, but I also always know that we go into conversation with this. But let's see. Um, where were you at school? In Cape Town, yeah, in Egypt. Okay, so you were here in Cape Town. Tell us about your super teacher, your favorite teacher. Standard 7. And uh, I got pulled into then the the IT lab to do a small little programming course. You know, and I think at the time it was Pascal, and um, you know everyone had to you know go through the little motions, and it was kind of you were blind typing things that you didn't really understand. Yeah. In I mean, you got to imagine you know what learning to code was like uh, back then, um, but you know. Uh, for some reason, I knew that. Like, oh my word, this is this is amazing. For some reason, I, I wanted I want to do this, and um, the school didn't have. There was no extra curriculum, anything like that, and um, you know, just based on the questions and my enthusiasm, um, there was a teacher there that was not an IT teacher. Didn't you know, this didn't exist really. Said you know, if you would like to continue to do it a little bit more, then you know, let's find some time and we'll 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 go oh. and do it. And um, that is, without a doubt, why I am in the business I am in today. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. Well, that, that's such an amazing story. That the fact is, a teacher realized that you were quite um, apt at something and you had interest in it. Yeah. And they created a platform for you to expand that. And, the, and I like the fact that you mentioned that the teacher uh, wasn't an IT teacher or a computer yeah, a geography scientist, teacher. a geography, geography teacher. teacher yeah. So uh, the message out of that for me resonates so well. It's like you can be a teacher of any subject; that doesn't matter. It's that relationship that you're building with the child, and just having the awareness, like or noticing that this kid is interested in something. How can I try and um, um, amplify that? How can I assist them? So thank, thank you very much no for worries, that. No worries, yeah. um, who should we be following on social media? Now I know Snapify. Yeah. I can't, I'm struggling with the word. Fire, snap. Fire. You, you talk. You, you, snap. Lee Lee fire. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> I want to point an L at the end it's, the whole time. It's fine. It's fine. We'll take it. We'll take it. So we definitely have to follow them. But who do we need to follow on social media that you find inspiration from, or you just think is cool? Well, I, sp I suppose you know I followed you uh, just the other day. So definitely <laughs> got to follow you. Thank you. Um, I think nothing, um, to be honest, nothing jumps out at me saying, you know, these are the, the, the guys that, um, you know, I, I really go and draw um, inspiration on. I think um, there's a lot of noise, particularly if we look at, um, in, in all industries, but, you know, um, I don't think there's anyone that I think, again, okay, you really should follow this one in the ed tech sector mm -hmm. in particular to say, oh my word, they've got great insights or, or whatever. I think everyone's challenges are so unique. And one of the you know, issues that everyone has is following some of the uh, hype or even um, advice that comes from overseas that isn't relevant. I think probably if I had to say, you know, where I'm getting most of my um, insights is actually looking to um, industries that have gone through similar challenges or disruption um, outside of education. So I'm looking at um, CEOs, leaders in particular that have gone through industries with big disruption where teachers are going through some of the same changes. I mean the bulk of what is being faced is a change in the makeup of what happens on a day to day. They're sort of like, you know, the, the workspace of teaching is fundamentally changing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how do we manage that? So, you know, even looking to things like, you know, uh, you know freelance culture, um, you know, um, 
some of the disruption you're seeing perhaps in more, more of the corporate space, how is that, those societal changes beginning to play out as it impacts our industry? Yeah. Um, and I think it's slower, but will arrive at, at schools. Those are the kind of things that I think I'm, I'm probably more interested in. Wonderful. Now, I think that that's, that's extremely valuable, this, this concept of transferable skills. Absolutely. Because that's something we want to teach our kids. That it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to teach a subject in a silo, mm -hmm. but having and looking at industries that are not exactly yours and learning from them. I think there's a lot of, of transferal that can happen yeah, and absolutely. lessons that we can learn from them. Um, what are you currently watching on Netflix or Showmax or that, that when you really have downtime and you get time to binge a series, what are you currently watching? Um, I think it probably what my wife and I binge watched recently. I think it's it's Lock and Key or Key and Lock, probably yeah. Lock and Key um, on Netflix. On Netflix. On Netflix, yeah. Uh, um, is that the series about the house and the house has got the different different keys? Different keys. Yeah, yeah. I, sta I, I started watching yeah. the first. Yeah. 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 I started watching the first four episodes yeah. to get through the yeah. series, but I'm enjoying it as well. Yeah. Uh, that was really good. It was really good. Yeah, it's one of those things that oh man, the Netflix the seasons take too long to come around again. You know, it's, it's, it's insane. Exactly. But yeah, a, a big, big, um, big Netflix fan. I, I think there's again, you know, there's definitely lessons, you know, to be looked at it. How they disrupted that to be applied in, in, in education. You know, in many ways, there's huge parallels between what they do and what, and what we do. I mean, we're talking about digital distribution, connecting, you know, content consumers with content producers. Um, there's a lot of parallels. So we we look to a lot of those adjacent mm -hmm. industries to yeah. understand. You know, other lessons to be learned. Now, Netflix for education is really a good idea. I, 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 know, <laughs> like I know. Choosing I mean, your, I mean, choose that, your own lesson. Uh, I know. I know. It's it's the, the the issue. Then you can see Netflix has moved in that uh, direction. The challenge with that is obviously um, it's very difficult to be the platform and the content producer. Yeah, so absolutely. you know, to try and create an environment of you know choosing your own learning path and. Um, optimizing content, we need to work very closely with the content producers, which in this case is the academic publishers for the most part, and, and then some of these new uh, content producers that you know are publishers, but they don't think of themselves in that way. In many cases, um, teachers producing their own absolutely, content. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and, but there's a, there's a lot to be learned yeah. from them. I mean, we would see them as you know they're self-publishing essentially anyway, um, and uh, I think that's definitely where it's going. There's there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, but it's going to take some time for market forces to, you know, force that. Of course, to, it'll, it'll to be happen. it'll be a, a mixed market for a, for a long time yeah, still. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what's your superpower? I would like to say maybe listening. Okay. You know? um, I think mm. a lot of people will say, um, "Well, that's not true because you talk way too much." Mm. Um, but I think it's you know, for me. If going to these events, even spending the time um, today, I want to you know hear again. You know what are what are those problem statements? You know, listening attentively to try and um, understand. Um, I think that is you know when I sit down and you know um, working with other companies, probably where um, I think. Our biggest success has come from is, you know, perhaps creating a culture of of that within the organisation, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, is, is a trait that, you know, I hold close to my heart. Now, people don't listen enough. In in many cases, people just listen long enough to get a response, and not long enough to actually hear what the other person has to say. So that being a superpower is really a rare superpower. Then the last one, Wesley, you get to build a school. You've got no restrictions on resources whatsoever. You're in charge to build the school. Like, what would you do? I think it's really about um, collaborative spaces. Um, you know, one of the, I you know did a trip through uh, a bunch of Finnish schools, and um, you know it, it's incredible to see how fluid the learning yeah. is. Um, it feels way more of a collaborative environment that you would see in, you know, I think, a, a highly functional company. You know? It's very open, um, things are really fluid, the subjects kind of blur into one another and you can see when you know, people are starting to do you know, PBL and things like that, it's beginning, beginning to happen, but the building itself kind of um, represented that to begin with. There wasn't the like, 
you know, the geography class and the science class. I mean, I even um, I visited one school where um, the school and the zoo are co-located. Wow. And, you know, the classrooms open out into the zoo. And so you don't do a field trip to the zoo. The school you, is the zoo. Yeah, and the, the zoo. zoo is the school. Yeah. Um, and, and it's blurring the lines. And, um, you know, the, the, the zoo is there, I mean, not for conservation or whatever, a large amount of it is, is for education. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's um, bringing, you know, maybe disciplines like, you know, technology and business sciences together to teach entrepreneurship, that there isn't the, the siloed approaches. And maybe having that as a, as a philosophy that flows into, you know, everything from how the curriculum is structured, how the building is structured, um, how teams are, are, are created for, for, for project work, really driving home that collaboration um, culture. And I think to a certain degree, fostering also, you know, some more of the softer skills which I think as our society evolves and, and you know, we move beyond this industrialized view of, of, of working, those things will become really, really important. Yeah. Thank you very much. When you open that school, let me know. I want to come teach there. I'll be down the road. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for spending time with us on this episode and watching all the way through. If you're still here and you enjoyed it and you like it, please subscribe to this channel on all of the different platforms. If you're on Facebook, like it. If you're on YouTube, subscribe. If you're on podcast, make sure that you leave a review. Um, we, we really strive to bring all the super teachers together so that we can make a positive difference in each and every classroom. Until next time, my name is Francois Nordia, this is Wesley Lynch, and we are Super Teachers.